know if you will. So you put that copper here, you take a spectrum. You get this spectrum, it doesn't look very great, but you end up seeing this piece. Okay? It don't look like peak, but just you know, a big arrow bars. You see this piece, okay? So it gets on spectrum with a unique shape. And then what you do is that you kick the spectrum, now you switch from the weapon that you know is real to the one that you know is a candidate, you're not sure it's real. You take a second spectrum. And now you compare the spectra with each other. If the spectra match and if the foil is the same, it means the weapons have to be the same. So this is like the physical analog one comparison is, think of checksums. Okay. You, know, you have a file, you run a checksum on it, and you get a hash. Okay. If you have two files, you run a checksum on them, and if the hashes match, it means the files have to be exactly the same. I mean, most, most of the same. Right? But the important thing is the following. Not only you can verify that the files are the same, but from the, from the hash, you can never reconstruct the content of the file. Yeah, okay. One-way function. It's a one-way, that's right. It's a almost one-way function. There's, of course, almost. Th there's some there's tricks there's which allow you to go back. Yeah. That's right. So one-way function is actually a good, good analog. Basically, this is, think of this as the file. Think of this as the checksum, and this is the hash. This is the hash. Okay. So from this, you can do comparisons, but you can never just track what is happening. Another way to think about this, this is actually the, 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 the formula to explain this. This is your signal. This is the part that depends on the weapon itself. This is the part that depends on the point itself. Think of this as one equation with multiple nodes. Right? So remember from mathematics, from school mathematics, if you have x plus y equals 10, and your teacher asks you what is x, x, x equals 10, think x can be anything. x can be from minus infinity to plus infinity. You have one, there's not enough information. One equation with, you know, with four nodes. Essentially, this is what it is. One equation with two unknowns. But the important thing is that the second unknown is kept fixed, which is what allows you to do these comparisons while finding out nothing about uh, about the other the other uh, uh, I mean, Yes. Uh, question, I guess this is a question that begs to be asked. Has anyone ever found a fake warhead? People have mm -hmm. never done this. People this is this is still to be done in the future. Oh, oh. People have never applied this to <coughs> actual warheads. Okay. This is for the possibility where you have inspection regime where American inspectors show up in Russia, and the Russians bring out warheads that are actually fake. They put some crap, they're keeping the good, good, good warheads in the back, right? The purpose of this thing is to precisely catch this kind of, this when I say hoaxing scenario, that's what they do. So how do we do our research? How do we study whether this is even possible? Just because it sort of looks good does not mean it's gonna work, right? It depends on the physics, depends on what the cross-sections are, etc. But without going too much detail, you know, it would be nice to do some real warheads, but at MIT we don't have warheads later on. Um, but, uh, so the foil is made by the hosts, and the inspectors are allowed to have visual access to the foil, but they are not allowed to look inside the foil. They are not allowed to know anything about what the foil is made of. Almost everything. They have but, uh, if you break the foil, if you drill a hole, uh -huh. it, uh -huh. then you, can, you have the access into the radiation from inside. That, that's, that's right, yeah. But you are not, you are not allowed to. So, so the inspector will never be allowed to tamper or change or take or analyze the foil. The only thing the inspector will be allowed to is visually be sure that nobody moved the foil between those two measurements. That's, that's very important. So okay, so what we do is that we have done a series of simulations. In physics, it's what's great is that if you understand the underlying physics, which we do, you can, instead of doing experimentation, you can do lots of simulations. So we do Monte Carlo simulations, which we, where we took uh, one approximate design of a warhead from open literature, and we run simulations where, where we shoot these photos, this X-ray I talked about, and we put the foil over here, and we'll look at the signal. We try to essentially say, okay, let's take this weapon and let's change it a little bit. How much will our signal change? Will we be able to see the difference or not? Maybe this process is such that we will just never see the difference. Okay? Just because it exists does not mean it's going to work. We had to re actually, we had to, one of the cool things of this thing is that we had to, well, it required lots of computational power, which we didn't have. But in this day and age, you can go to Amazon and you can rent something like 10,000 cores, use them for an hour, pay $100, $200, and then shut them down. Okay. So something that in the past only national laboratories and major facilities could only allow themselves, now a mere mortal can go, can use, pay their $100, $200, and it is incredibly important for doing these things. Uh, without this, it would be very hard to do. So we did a few simulations of different uh, geometries, and what we did was that we tried to take the original weapon and we tried to change a different part and ask ourselves, does our signal change enough for us to be able to see it? And how long we have to measure to be able to see it, which is very important for, for operational um, uh, computation. So this, this is, so this is the actual simulated spectrum 
from a genuine temple or a real uh, temple. The red one is the signal from a, from a warhead where we replace the plutonium, which is very valuable, with uranium 238, which is you can almost buy it on the street. And the question was that, will this spectra be different enough for us to tell the difference? So if you look, you can see there's a clear discrepancy between all these peaks. You can see that the peaks corresponding to the, uh, to the, to the template are much larger than the peaks that correspond to 238. So the shock is that, yes, we are going to see this very easily. Okay? And we estimated that it takes something like order of 10 minutes. 10 minutes measurements would be able to catch a hoax like this. But then we did much more sophisticated hoax. Rather than replacing plutonium with, um, uh, with depleted uranium, we also did try to attempt replacements where we replaced plutonium with different type of plutoniums. For a bomb, we need something that's called weapons-grade plutonium, which is very rich in one isotope and doesn't have the other isotope. Which, and there's other type of plutoniums which are not that way, are much easier to find. You can get them out of a reactor. So the question is, can we catch those type of hoaxes? So we tried all these different processes, different uh, scenarios. So here's like a prison thing. You know, there's lots of information here, but if you just focus on these peaks over here, I mean, you clearly see that for a given energy, these things are not overlapping with each other, as they should, if the two things were the same. And you can also do statistical tests, find out how many sigma difference there is. You know, for people who are not in statistics, think if, that, if you see something that's a five sigma difference, it's basically, uh, you're asking the question, how likely is this to be a result of a random fluctuation, which are always happening. Right? Five sigma means that it's 0.0001%. So if you see a five sigma discrepancy, it means that they are definitely different. So we tried different scenarios, and for each one of them, again, it's, it's hard to see because of the background, but we saw much higher than five sigma discrepancies. Okay. We published our paper in Physical uh, Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences last summer. We also focused on something that's called geometric hoaxes, which I won't talk about. It turns out that you can also do geometrical tricks that will allow uh, them to hoax the system. But we showed that if we do simple rotations of the system and do multiple measurements, we'll catch those two as well. This is one of our students. This is actually now where I'm also doing some experimentation. And this is my student, Jason Babrick from Canada. So we have a 2.5 MeV accelerator. We have a beam that's coming above. It gets bent by a small battle magnet. There's a radiator. We get a photon beam. Uh, this is a uranium target right over here. So over. And right behind this is the semiconductor detector that we're asking about. Uh, it's a high purity germanium detector. It has actually mechanical coolers right over here to, to operate there. So we're actually taking spectra from this. And for trying to understand it, we can uh, see the physics that we want to be seeing. So this is some of the actual data. This is not simulation, this is data, finally. So these are the three main peaks of uranium-235. Okay. And the interesting thing is that you can also see the second piece that come as almost like, um, I don't know, like twins. Every peak has another peak, which is 45 keV off. It has to do with the fact that you can have decays from a particular excited state to the ground state, or you can have a decay to the first excited state. So you'll have an uh, emission of a photon which is 45 kV short, 45 kV less. That results in this thing over here. Some conclusion, because I think I'm running over time. <coughs> so we live essentially in nuclear age. It's not as bad as used to be during Cold War, where we had 70,000 warheads. But we still have enormous number of warheads. And this is not just Russia's and America's problems. This is everyone's problems. Okay? If something bad happens, everyone is going to be in huge trouble. Um, there's enormous you know, stockpiles of nuclear weapons in the world. There's always the risk of accidental nuclear war, which is something that, you know, uh, something that is really the ultimate threat. Okay? Um, and if this thing happens again, it's not just a threat to American Russia, it happens to us, to Azeris, to Turks, to Georgians, Persians. Nuclear winter does not tell differences in the religion and ethnicity and genetics. Everyone knows. Um, so we essentially need, we need to enable much more ambitious arms reduction treaties to solve this problem. And one of, the, um, one of the barriers to all such treaties, not the only one, the main one is political, but the other one is technological. And that's just, can we come up as physicists, mathematicians, engineers, can we come up with some kind of applications of what we do, which will make those treaties easier? Okay. And uh, we're working on one of these ideas, and we think that it has clear sensitivity to these types of hoaxing. It does protect information, and this is something that we're working on. And that said, I'm ready for your questions. Oh. Uh, I think, uh, is there any chance, I'm sure you probably listen to this, any chance of you, you know, pumping x-rays into a, um, 
Yeah, it wasn't that, you know, some loose currents could cause some funny things to happen on the lines of So, so, so it, funny that you ask, people do ask this question very often. The question is that, can you heat up the explosives for them to detonate, or things like that. So we don't think that there's you, you will cause enough heating. Like for the specific examples, we actually, for our paper, we did a calculation, find out that you heat it up by 0 0.5 degrees. So it's, it's, it's not a problem. But, but that, that's, a, that's general for all the things uh, in the valley, so. So you probably see a uh, like verification of the depression, right? Yeah. Well, uh, without cryptography, we, in real life, uh, how we verify? We just uh, have a passport, see your pictures, and then you to verify the history. So the cryptography, verification, usually cryptography. Uh -huh. We have uh, like software, no, nothing, just. Uh -huh. Then uh, your verification is like you have reference information, like right. a passport. Uh -huh. Then uh, right. you just verify well, if this guy knows the password, then he's verified, right? Right. Uh, has access. Except it's incomplete, right? Because what if someone else has a password too? So it's not unique. Well, this, yeah, this, uh, well, uh, in cryptography, uh -huh. you, you cannot avoid that the situation. But I mean, it is possible uh -huh. then. If you sell your password to somebody, he can, it can be authenticated, right. he cannot do anything with that. Right. Uh, okay, now, in, in, this, in this case, you are speaking about uh, kind of verification. Of, is it uh, about uh, some, uh, you, you, you have to verify, of course, in physical, uh, by, by using physical uh, methods. That's right. It, it, uh, it has some information there or some properties what you, uh, so if we go back to this uh, yeah what you verifying here uh, so, yes yes so really what you are verifying right you are verifying that this weapon and this weapon produce the same signal that that's what you actually are measuring okay the same signal it means uh, if, okay so if the signals are the same you can it, mean, it means that they they have the same uh, same physical. makeup same makeup same same composition I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. So in the case with the, with the, with the passwords, uh, this is what you know in your mind. Okay? That's right. That's right. And this is what is physically there. Okay. So, so, so I mean, the analogy with password is that, let's say you enter your password, right? But let's say you are worried about privacy, right? From password, the other side can never figure out what is your age or something you want to prove. 